Melbourne's in Cambridge because Steve isn't in Cambridge. Uh, I, I, yes. Um, I'll knock off my. Well, Andrew, I mean, in the sense that what I, I think the simple um, syllogism was that Darwin is materialism and epigenetics is energy in the context of energy equals mass yes. times the speed of light squared kind of thing. Yeah. So I, I'd say yes to you, but with the proviso, I, yeah, I mean, it, it is, a, they are, the intermediates are nil potent, yes. But you would get to nothing via energy then, is that I've understood that? Well, the way I was thinking, I mean, the, the thing that dawned on me was, I mean, I've been thinking all for weeks now that nil potency means zero, but in fact, in the context of Big Bang and equipoise and homeostasis, it's actually, the formation of matter. So in that sense, it's everything material. So that's why I'm contrasting it with energy. Okay. As the flip side of that. What do you mean by that, John? So the nil potent is, I mean, it's certainly, I, um, I'll have to ask Peter in a second, but certainly that's the mechanism whereby he, you see matter coming from Peter. Right. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. Right. So that's, I mean, I had it flipped. Yeah. And when I realized that it actually was matter, that matter, matter cannot exist in the cosmos with, without that equal and opposite reaction, which I, I'm assuming is um, the nil potent or nil potent state. And so I'm contrasting that with, so that's Darwinian evolution in my way of thinking as materialism. And in contrast to that, so the default mode would be epigenetics is energy. And so you only have to walk, assuming that things can only exist as either energy or matter. I think that's correct. I'll draw your diagram. Right, Peter? Yeah, well, I mean, it, nil potency is an interface, isn't it? It's what? interfaces between the, the local and the non local and the, yeah, um, okay. the discrete and the continuous. It, it isn't zero, it squares to zero. I understand. It's zero on each side. It, it's, when you put the two sides together, it's zero. Yeah. Isn't actually zero, but it, it 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 does mean that everything is zero. Yeah. So I mean, I was saying earlier that so in the any given um, balanced equation, whether it's E equals M C squared, sodium plus chlorine equals sodium chloride, or endoderm mesoderm ectoderm equals embryo, the equal sign is what I assume is the the equipotent state. It sums to zero, right? It balances out. Well, you can make it zero, can't you? You can rearrange the equation. Yeah. No, it is the, the zero. The equation zero. Yeah, okay. it's okay. the square to zero. You have to square it to get zero. Understand. It's the square root of zero. Right. So, when just uh, you got to have two. Just uh, what you say there, Peter. Just uh, I, I kind of that uh, when you said it's like a, a boundary between continuous and discontinuous. Yeah. It's about what was the other? What was the other? Uh, between local and non-local interface yeah it's an interface so how how different is that to the conception of a mark and spencer brown then? well a mark, a mark can be effectively square to zero it depends how you do it hey, you, have square, you have to square to zero so you eliminate negative numbers correct can't do it at the moment I'm involved in a meeting tell them i'm involved in a meeting why, 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 does it, why does it have to square to zero? Or, or how, how and why does it... Why, why, where does that come from, the idea of squaring to zero? What because the, it's two things. It's a combination of two things. The object and everything else. And the, the total is zero. And the yeah. total in the local sense, which is squaring, and the total in the global sense, which is adding, both have to be zero. So give me that okay. sentence again, Peter. In a, the, the nil potent yes. is, gives a total yes. with respect to the rest of the universe of zero. It's the, the object in the, in the universe, which is zero. Okay. So, yeah, okay, I, I agree with that. It's got to be a local total, and yes. effectively that means multiplication. And it's got to be a, a global total, which means addition. A local total means 
multiplication. Yeah, if you multiply things, you're kind of locally adding. Uh, go on, explain that a bit more, Peter. If you multiply two by three, you you can you can say you can put together two squares and three squares, different colours, and each one has to be paired with one of the other ones. So it's a kind of local thing. Mm. Whereas if you just add them, you just put them all together and you get five. But if you multiply them, you get six, because each has got to pair off with one of the others. Peter, and all the others. It's got to pair off with all the others. In the stuff. If I multiply two by three, I've, and I've got two yellow squares and three red ones, I've got to mul I've got to pair off each of the yellow ones with each of the red ones. It's all got to be done. Every single bit of it has got to be done. I'll have to, yeah, I, no, I... Well, that's what multiplication really is. It's a kind of local addition. You're, you're um... It's not a way I've thought about it, really, at all. Uh, or, or may have done, but in different words. Or, or, or different way of thinking about it. Yeah, it's an addition. I'm not quite... But it's a kind of localised addition, so each bit has to pair off with one of the other bits. Uh, okay, okay, so... You can't just treat it in a global way, all of that and all of that. It doesn't work. I see, I see, I see how you're kind of using global and local there, yeah, okay. Yeah. Each, each bit has to actually pair off with every other single bit? Yeah. Yeah, that, mm -hmm. that makes sense. And, and when we learned to do multiplication, uh, at least in Louisiana, it was basically just a, a fast form of addition. Yeah, repeated cool. addition yeah. Is, is the, ba is the, is the um, pedagogical basis of teaching that. And I don't, and that when I was kind of trying to do that, when I was trying to write this paper about Spencer Brown and maths education, I was kind of, all of these things were occurring to me. It's thought like, you know, that that's a, can be a conceptual blind alley and no wonder kids go up a conceptual blind alley if it's just kind of repeated addition. And, you know, we just kind of, it's, 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 it's useful, but you've got to get quickly beyond that really conceptually. Well, there's and that was what was, I couldn't quite get to it uh, in, in my own mind at the time when I was thinking about, you know, what would it look like if you had a, a math curriculum that was based entirely philosophically on Spencer Brown. Uh, but, you know, those are the kind of things that were just flagging up, you know, that it would be quite different conceptually. Do you think? So, so Peter, let me just ask you for this escapes my mind, a squaring is really what you've just been saying about locally. Squaring is multiplying everything itself by itself. Everything gets multiplied. Yeah, everything is that by it? everything. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Um, so Peter, in the, two, in the two brackets, you know you, you, you make the two brackets yeah. out of Einstein's mass energy equation. One is local, yes. the other is, is everything else. Is that right? Yes. In, in the quantum sense, yes, that's what happens in quantum mechanics. Your local thing, your particle, whatever it is, local state, and then you've got everything else. I mean, there's two ways of defining anything. You can define it to be what it is, or you can define it to be what it is not, which is everything else. Go on, keep going. I love that. And so, and so you, you've got the thing defined to be what it is, and also the thing defined to be what it is not, with yeah. the same information. Yes, of course. I love so, that philosophically. So in the case of, say, a cell, a small living organism, yeah. you could define the cell as this internal chemical thing or its environment. Yes. yes. Now, in what sense do they add to nothing? They multiply to nothing and add to nothing because they're an energy um, conservation. And then any en energy conservation can always be expressed by Einstein's equation. Brilliant. It's not okay. obvious, but it can be done that way. Well, okay, so so, so how do they add to nothing? How do they add to nothing? Well, because the universe is nothing. So if you take the, the, the cell and the rest of the universe and put them together, then you're going to get nothing. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah. 
Are you saying that the, the cell boundary is uh, an arbitrary thing? It's not, therefore, in some sense... It's, it's can... not necessarily arbitrary because it is a system which, can, which maintains a sort of energy exchange. Yeah. And a system that does that can be treated as though it is a boundary of some sort with the rest of the universe. Yeah, is, is, is energy is energy a consequence of nil potency then? Um, yeah, in a sense, it is because if you if you um, to get the nil potent structure, you've got to do a conservation of energy equation. That's what yeah. it is. Yeah. So when John talks about um, so he's, he's he, John, you put something in the chat um, that. Um, the Darwinian model relates to a materialistic um, perspective and the epigenetic model that you're talking about is in some way to do with well what you're calling energy transfer but I suspect what Peter would say is um, a conservation law. Yeah I'm, I'm not sure energy can be transferred something is transferred but I'm not sure it's energy. Okay yeah, yeah that's interesting that's really interesting and in embryology, that's what we do. So yeah, you, you, we talk about energy transfer. And it's very common to talk about that, and it, it's a metaphor we use. Yeah. But I'm not sure that the actual energy, energy itself, is ever transferred. I think it's the, the sort of realization of it in some form that's transferred. I think but, I was, I think I was skept, skeptical of that when I was doing my chemical engineering degree. That's why I didn't do very well because it's all. <laughs> <laughs> But in, hey, Peter, can I can I go back to something you said uh, a couple of minutes ago that I wanted to get everyone's take on when you were making a kind of value things that they are or by Let me or not? I'm sorry. Yeah. Can you repeat? It was distorted. Yeah, I'm sorry. You were saying that um, you can define things by what they are or by what they're not. And that brought up for me, I'm in the middle of reading uh, George Lukas, Who's Freedom? And it's about you know, different sort of political ideologies. And it occurred to me when you said that, that our big mistake is always relying on defining what things are yes. without going to, to, yeah. to define what they're not. Because if you're not clear on that, there's too much room for people to do awful things. So, so we have to learn in some way. Mark, your um, your yacht is letting you down, I'm afraid. Yeah, it did. Your, your sound is not coming over that well, but um, we, we got the basic idea, I think, of what you said, but I couldn't get the details right at the last <laughs> sentence. I my connection went away. So it's just, just the idea that one should go to the trouble to at least attempt to define what something's not. Yes. I'm just relying on the thing it. Otherwise, there's much room for confusion. I definitely think that's true. Yes. Can I can I ask John? Um, oh. Because obviously we're 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 skirting around this is issue of energy and energy transfer, and um, whether energy is transferred or whether it's actually something else, or what we call energy transfer is something else. Um, what what do you feel about that, John? Yeah, I just wanted to finish that. So I literally, in, in embryology, when you go from a zygote to a blastula to a, you know, on and on and on, the signaling is actually an energy transfer. So you have, it requires energy to synthesize the, bi the biomolecular signaling uh, substance, but then it binds to a receptor on the surface of another cell from a different germline origin and it generates high energy phosphate. Mm. That's why I say, and I was contrasting, I was sort of being sort of somewhat super reductionist in the sense that that's very different from the way we think about uh, evolution in a Darwinian sense, because in that context, it's um, phenotypes. It's, um, it's how the thing appears physically rather than, so it's mat matter rather than energy. I, I was trying to make that contrast. And so there's a radical difference in the way that, that the two f processes transpire. Right? Um, 
I'm just um, so if if Peter's right and he says that he actually he's not convinced that energy transfers at all it's some sort of conservation there's some sort of conservation law going on what we see as transfer in that process what might it be Peter well we can transfer other things we transfer boson for example in a um in a physical reaction, we transfer a boson from one particle to another. They, they transfer particles, and that might seem like energy transfer. But to me, the, the energy is like a kind of, my guess is like energy is a kind of continuum which doesn't alter at all. And it's, it, it, it just, it's the mode of operandum, mode of operand, operation changes. Uh, um, and that's what transfers. So, for example, we can tr transfer charge, particles, things like that. We can tr transfer stuff like that. And it looks like we're transferring energy, but I'm not sure we are. So could that be expressed in your algebra? Is it, is it an algebraic sort of uh, restructuring? If you took one of your um, tables and you said, OK, so you can have energy with these parameters in this configuration, or you can have yeah. it in a different configuration. Is that the same? I think that's roughly what happens. You've got the same energy, but it's in a different configuration. A different configuration of parameters. Peter, it sounds to me like you're saying energy is a mode. It's a mode for something. In other words, it's a carrier. The way it operates and the way it manifests itself changes, I think. But I don't know that the energy itself transfers. Mm. I mean, at the, at, at the basis of physics at the moment, we have this uniform thing, the Higgs field, and that's higher, it's got higher energy than any known particle. And a particle uh, appearing at a point wouldn't have that energy, but it wouldn't mean that that energy would disappear from that point. It, it would just mean that that manifestation of it as that particle would appear. So, okay. so if, I, if we could just flesh out that what I was saying. So in terms of if you pick up on what I was saying about the energy flow, that energy flow, or the way I'm thinking of it, translates into calcium flow, uh, calcium flows. Yeah. And that relates back to, so when egg and sperm meet, there's a huge calcium burst. Yeah. yeah. That's well, instantation. Calcium is a particular material, a particular chemical. And that flows, yeah, certainly. And the, the, but I don't think the total energy changes from one place to another. Somehow, I don't think it does. Um, despite what people loosely say, it does. I don't really think it does, deep down. That's my guess. But I'm, I'm, not, I'm not absolutely certain so, so about Peter, it. Peter, if it's a binary, if it's either energy or mass, it's got to be one or the other, right? No? Yeah, well, to, to me, energy and mass are the same thing. Mass is just another form of energy. And, the, and we think of it as being very solid, but even even the mass of something like an electron isn't. It comes from zeta bar vague on the vibrational, uh, deep so vibrational. Peter, how is energy, uh, how energy uh, dispersed? Is it evenly dispersed in the universe, or, or is it... I, th I think it's got the same value at every point in the universe. It just manifests itself in different yeah. forms. Yeah. Matter in some places, charge in some places, bosons in some places, fermions in others, and, and then higher up, you know, there's all kinds of uh, exchanges. So is, is this a question about measurement? Is it, is it, on the one hand, we're talking about measuring energy as a value, which you derive from an equation, or yeah. measuring energy as a structure, as a sort of configuration of parameters? Is yeah, that that's the, the difference between it, yeah. As yeah. a per as a value, I don't think it's going to change, but as a structure, it will. Right. If I could just car carry my thought further, further down the road. So, so you're generating an embryo and it becomes an off the offspring. And the purpose, in my opinion, in a paper I wrote, is that the offspring then enters the environment and its mission, its purpose, is to determine whether there are significant changes in the environment relative to that organism. It's not all change. And I have, to, and we don't know how that transpires other than biochemically, there is a transfer of that. If it's a substance, you know, like in 
in the case of the model we use for the induction of asthma in children, it's nicotine we use as a, as a proxy for cigarette smoke. But that's, that's uh, very specific. But what I'm saying is I, I have to assume, hypothesize, that what is being detected is an energy change, ultimately. Otherwise, it makes no sense to me. But again, I, I'll defer to you, Peter, because maybe I'm using the energy too loosely. Use of energy would be different from mine in this context. I'm talking about the total value of energy, such as it is, or not the manifestation, which is what you were talking about. The manifestation changes because yeah. you get a different chemical going in and a different chemical coming out, getting a different object coming out, an embryo. But yeah. I don't but I think it's all organized by nature in such a way that the energy itself doesn't change. But I don't think that's obvious at all. Mm. And I'm I'm not certain I'm right, but that's my been my hunch for a long while that it doesn't change at all. And that it's the manifestation that changes. So well, I understand what you're saying, but I, I was trying to contrast Darwinian versus Lamarckian inheritance. Yeah. And in that sense, is a binary. I don't, it's, maybe it's overly sim simplifying the yeah. problem. I also don't think Lamarck ought to get the credit for it either, but that's a different thing. Oh, okay. <laughs> that's historical. But in terms of um, free energy, Peter, and the distinction, you know, between useful and non-useful energy. How, how does this, how does this relate to that? Oh, well, free energy does transfer because that's a particular form of energy. Okay. And yeah, and useful and non-useful, they transfer, yes, definitely. Um, but it, I'm saying the total amount, I don't think changes. That's my guess, okay. really. I, I haven't got any total proof of that being true yeah so this is a, this is a cosmological hypothesis really yeah it's just the sort of feeling i have that this is probably the case all right well, you know, not, that, that the actual the, the the structure will change because you can get free energies a different structure from useless energy and so on so we just published a book uh demonstrating the reversibility of evolution which cannot happen in physics correct so my assumption is because we can demonstrate in invertebrates and vertebrates that there is reversal of the evolutionary um, sequence, that evolution and is actually a pseudo-physical property. It's not what? physics per se, it's a mimicking Hang on. John, are you saying things like endosymbiosis can go in reverse, that a cell could expel something? Well, I didn't, I'm not getting it. So, so th there's like, 25 chapters in this book, and 23 of them are on invertebrates. So there are all these experts in invertebrate biology. Um, and the ringleader is this guy, Jean Dieu, who has these ammonite collections, so these shelled organisms. And he has been able to show that when there were geochemical and geophysical stresses on those organisms, you see that they revert back to an earlier phase of their evolution. And there are many examples of that. In the case of the work that Bill Miller and I contributed to that book, um, the uh, chronic diseases are all diseases of simplification. And that simplification is actually reverse evolution. You're going back to an earlier phase of uh, an uh, earlier homeostatic set point in order to be able to, uh, to, to cope with the stress on the system, essentially so that you can transfer genes to the next, to the next generation. It's, it's a survival mechanism. But, I, but what I'm saying is that in physics, you don't see reversal. It's, it's, uh, it, it's non-commutative, non commutative. whereas in biology, it is commutative. It can reverse. I, I mean, can't imagine, though, that you would get the same species. They might be of an earlier order, but it wouldn't go back to the same as they've been. In, I don't, can't believe that. Well, there is this phenomenon in biology. It's heterochrony. So, so that's a description of what I'm saying. It, it's a well-recognized phenomenon. It's Certainly, a, I they can go back to something like what they were, but I don't think they go back to the same. It wouldn't be the same reversal. Things would have changed. Level, yeah, so maybe that at the structural level, it's not faithful, but at the molecular level, it does revert to the earlier signaling pathways, literally. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So uh, maybe it would, it, it's going to look weird. It's not going to yeah. look, it's enough to be faithful in terms of the phenotype, but structurally and functionally, it mimics an earlier stage to maintain homeostatics. Uh, John, can I ask, because I know you, that you're, um, you've done lots of work on this, the lung cells um, under emphysema. 
and I know that you made the observation or, or you, you, you cite the observation that um, the, the lung cells under emphysema seem to resemble the behavior of um, the, the frog lung. Is that, that's right. But what, what, what are the similarities? What, what, what's the detail of um, the behavior that you can measure by, um, to, to actually see that? So developmentally, what you see is the earlier phases of the lung developmentally are these very large spaces, which then are compartmental, they're, they're septated. They right. divide into small and small units until you get alve these very small alveolar structures. Yeah. The frog has these huge spaces are called right. favioli, and the frog doesn't have a diaphragm either. So in us, you know, the diaphragm, the muscle at the base of the lung, it drops and it causes a negative pressure. And that's why we, that's how we breathe. Frogs just take a big bite of air and they shove it down into this muscular structure. Frogs but we actually, eat air. Is that right? What? Frogs are eating air. Correct. They're, it's, yeah, they're, they're, they're buccal breathers is what the technical term that's is. That's amazing. They take a big, you know, gulp of air. Just like in the reverse, like a boom, you know, they yeah. make these really loud croaking so, noises. So they're bad table manners are the result of the lack of a diaphragm. Yeah, but you still got to kiss a lot of them to, uh, you know. <laughs> but, uh, uh, um, but but and but just and not not to perseverate here, but we actually sh there's a there's a hormone in the lung leptin which is produced also in the gut and it's important in the fat metabolism. But but in the lung, leptin is used as the signaling mechanism from the connective tissue to the epithelial cells that form the alveoli. Mm -hmm. We actually published a paper showing that if you use frog leptin, you can actually recapitulate the development of the frog lung identically to that of a mouse or a human lung. So we know that the intermediates are this one and the same. It's just a matter of how, at what stage it stops because it's um, adapting to its particular, you know, the organism is, is adapting to its particular condition. So in frogs, they can breathe through their skin also. So that their lungs don't have to be as advanced, if you will, if you think of it in terms of a hierarchical kind of relationship. They don't have to be as advanced as ours do. I mean, we, we breathe a bit through our, our, our skin also, but not to the same degree as a frog. We can? Yeah, we do. I absorb oxygen through my hands. Yeah, I remember there was that, that um, it was an old Thin Man uh, um, episode back in the 50s, and this guy <laughs> has this Midas touch fantasy, and he's dipping women in gold leaf. Yeah. And they're suffocating to death because they can't breathe through their skin. I thought that, that was an Ian James Bond. Fantasy. James <laughs> Bond. <laughs> Gold Goldfinger, Finger. yeah. Oh, that too. Yeah. <laughs> that was a later iteration of the same saga. Right. No, we do. There is some breathing through the skin. It's minimal, but it, 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 it does occur. There is a carry through from frogs to human. Fantastic. Um, so is this related to all the stuff that's been going on on stem cell research? So um, people um, deriving stem cells from ordinary cells and then, you know, it's basically taking an ordinary cell back to a stem cell and then moving forwards again. Is, is, is this related? Is this the same kind of mechanism? Well, what I just described earlier about the, the septation mechanism, it's now known that there are stem cells sitting in those, where those septa are, okay, where the septation is. And yeah. they, they sense the, the tension and they're, they're activated through the septation mechanism. So yes, the stem cells are recruited locally or from the bone marrow for that, you know, that happens too. Yeah. But there's local stem cells and there are also systemic stem cells that are recruited for, uh, for septation of the lung and, and all kinds of other special effects. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so I'm wondering now, I mean, it's, it, this, this is very interesting, isn't it? So. Um, this reversibility in biology, is this, how does this relate to what we consider to be irreversibility in physics? Or is, is the reversibility in biology not really reversibility, but something else? Where do you I sit on reversibility? That, it, that, it, that, I, that I'm over-interpreting what's going on. I, I do think that there, is, that there is reversibility. And the reason that I... And, and, and as, a, as a consequence, because you're violating, you know, Rich Heiberger and I had long discussions about thermodynamics, you know, the second law of thermodynamics and whether in fact, the, uh, you know, biology is circumventing the second law. And I'm saying, well, I think to some degree it is, but my point being that 
biology only mimics physics. It doesn't, it's not faithful to physics. Mm. It is somewhat, uh, you know, uh, it cheats. <laughs> yeah. Um, to some degree, you know, so thermo second law of thermo thermodynamics, what I'm talking about with regard to um, reversibility, those are, those are not strictly adherent to physical laws. So it's, it's good enough to get yeah. by. It's not perfect. It's not, we're not, well, just the mere fact that in physics, is the whole greater than the sum of its parts? Certainly in biology it is. I think that the hallmark of organic life is the whole being greater than the sum of its parts. Yeah, well, the good condensed matter is very different from separate particles. Mm. Though but many of the same things apply. Yeah, it, it, same rules. Yeah, it, it operates differently in many ways. You, you get mimicking of particle physics in condensed matter as well, but it's never quite the same. So the same rules are playing out, but they're just different mm. constituents. Yeah. Different I feel like in my high school, you know, bio, uh, biology text, it was saying in the preface, it said, well, you know, the sum total, total of all the chemicals in 1962 or whatever it was, uh, is equal is like 72 cents. Um, but we're worth a lot more than that as human beings. So the point they're trying to make it, we're trying to make is that there's this, you know, the uh, force vital is what organic life is about. It's greater than the sum of its parts. It's emergent. Is, I don't, can you make an analogy to any physical, is that what you're saying? In, in terms yeah, of, of course, yeah. I mean, but chemistry is not is basically physics, but it doesn't look much like physics because it's emergent. Yeah. Right, but, okay. So is there a one-to-one -one relationship there? Like I assume that organic life was different in that sense, that that's what distinguishes life from non-life. Well, I, I'm not sure of what distinguishes life from non-life, but, um, the, the certainly it's true that the, the the sum of every anything is always greater than the parts, mm. or less. It can be less as well, can't it? Well, it's different from the parts. Different anyway. from the parts is how you describe it. Yeah. A gestalt. You don't say more. You say different. They it can be less. A whole. It's more, but it might not always be. Um, so a whole can be less than the things that. Compo that compose it. A black hole is less than the sum of its parts, right? Um, a, all the numbers are simpler than perhaps even one individual complex, a very complicated long number, because you can generate all the numbers with a very simple algorithm. You can have, just add one, keep going, you know, compared with any particular number, which is ludicrously complicated. Hmm. I'm sorry, I'm talking about holes as defined by Henry Bortoff as influenced by uh, Daniel Bohm. He says a hole, like the plot of a novel, is less than the parts. Okay. Because they all hang together in this gestalt thing. This is a hole rather than a hole. A, yes. No, I'm talking about, I'm talking about a W-H-O-L-E, which is, of course, quite different to yeah. the... Um, where is it? I'm sorry, the paper I was trying to flash up, which was by um, um, David Lewis about holes, H-O-L-E-S, things you fall into and break your neck. Yeah. He's talking about holes in cheese. It's very, very entertaining. I, I, I love it. Yeah, yeah but like, one. you know, a Henry Moore sculpture with a big hole in the Yeah, middle. yeah, it's like, about, ho it, are, are, are holes real? Uh, yeah. But W-H-O-L-E-S is the kind you get in um, bought off down bone are actually less, they're kind of nothing things. Yeah. So like when Donald Trump plays golf and he has a hole in one. Oh, no, 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 no. Yeah. Getting, right? <laughs> Fabricated. So if you try to describe a tune as a whole, because all the notes comprise to make this unit, but it isn't an additive thing, it's something which cannot be described. You get to this limit of indescribable nothing, which becomes this beautiful whole thing. This is this is what Henry Bortoff writes about. Henry um, he came to Anpo once. Did he? Did yes, he? I met him. Yeah. yeah but he did that, but a very, very interesting man. I, I, what I read, you know. Yeah. Sadly, he's no longer with us, but uh, I met him there. Yeah. Wow. Met him a bit. But the sheet, John. the sheet is not is not greater than the sum of its parts. It's only when we listen to it and we interpret it as organic beings that we create. Yeah. The greater than the sum of its parts thing. Right? Okay. Well. Yes. To a, to a human being, it is less than the sum of its parts. Yes, there's. Uh, I but, but Andrew, where's the nilpotent then? Isn't the nilpotent 
the totality of the situation. So it is the, the biological, edu musically educated person and the phenomenon that they're engaging with. That, that's, that, that is the nil potent, that's the zero, isn't it? Uh, yes, the tune as perceived by a human being is, yeah. is nothing. Yeah, but so it's not the tune in itself. If um, the point about a thing like a tune or a sentence, a poem is, if you make a change to it, it can be wrong. And at a certain point of perfection, it's kind of smooth and it vanishes. Whereas if you make a tune, it becomes visible. Mm. If you... And you can, you, can, you can experience the nothing without, without having to read all of it. You, you, you don't have to... You haven't understood a book when you get to the last word. You are understanding it as you're going along. You're experiencing the plot okay. as a kind of nothing. I'm only repeating what, I, what, 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 what Henri Bortoff says. It's nothing. Yeah, I don't, he gets I, it from I, Goethe. And, and Bateson. Bateson as well, yes. Bateson, uh, Bateson on perception and yeah. meaning, yeah. yeah. But if I could just go back to what I said a couple of Zooms ago about, so if my lipid hypothesis has any value, um, um, it is only when there, everything in the, in the totality was the implicate, Bohm's implicate order until we showed up and created the explicate order. So in the context of what you're saying, Andrew, we are, it's only because we exist that there's this phenomenon of written music becoming greater than the sum of its parts because we exist. If without us, it wouldn't, that wouldn't happen, would it? But, well, there is no music without people. Um, yeah, right. Obviously, you know. Um, what what a tune is is a very mysterious thing, and the, in the end, you, I think you have to say when you try and so answer the question, "What is a tune?" or "What is a plot?" You get the conclusion it can't be defined. It can be lost, though, can it? <laughs> That's a kind of shanker yeah. thing, isn't it? Yeah. Um, I. Yeah. No, there's a, the, the, the the behind what John's just said is this whole issue of um, history, it seems to me. And, and this, is, this is something that, um, John, in, in our exchanges, uh, your, your complaint uh, about a lot of uh, prior attempts to try and explain the world and try and explain biology is that they don't have this diachronic dimension. They don't have this historical dimension that um, the past really matters in the present and, um, and indeed for the future. And I think, I think that's incredibly important. That, that seems to, sep to me, that separates what someone like Gregory Bateson, who I think had a very powerful insight into this stuff, that separates what he was saying from what you're saying, because I don't think he really appreciated the importance of history. Um, and small and small and for that matter. Sorry, you know, Einstein, the Smolin book about you know, Einstein. Yes, yes, that's right. Uh, Smolin does not do the deep dive. It's always synchronic. It's not diachronic. Yeah. And if I anyone's interested, I'm reading this, um, which I I think is is a beautifully written thing. Um, it's it's published last year, and um, if you want a sort of quick summary of um, the state of quantum mechanics as 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 Lee Smolin sees it um, and particularly a sort of revision of um, the the sort of uh, Copenhagen um, understanding of quantum mechanics and where David Bohm and those kinds of people fit in I, it really is wonderful so um, but there's a problem I think so I mean I've read only half of it so far but it's very difficult for me to move on because he is, it's for him, like everyone, it's a one-to-one -one relationship between um, what we observe and how quantum mechanics interfaces with biology. And I don't think that's how it works. I think that you have to go back to the first principles of physiology, the, the homology between the cell and the atom. It is at that level that the quantum mechanics is relevant. And then you can see the manifestations later in the arc, but you have to go, you have to pay attention to where it all, to the first principles, to the, um, to the ontology, as well as the epistemology. They both have to work together. Otherwise it doesn't make, to my mind, it makes no sense. Yeah. 
it's forcing it's forcing the, the these homologies. They, so they I, exist. He's not looking. He's not looking at it at the, at the right um, level, in my opinion. I, I was kind of swept away by the way he expressed himself because I, I read a, another book by him and I found it hard going. This was much easier going. Um, but what I was intrigued by was whether how whether he would express something similar to what Peter is expressing in terms of um, nil potency and particularly what's in Peter's rewrite structure. This this sort of and and he doesn't he doesn't do it. He doesn't he doesn't quite he doesn't get there. He doesn't have this sort of um, okay. fractal structure. It seems to me. No, and many years ago I. I've mentioned before, I had a close astrophysicist friend who drags me to a symposium chaired by Neil deGrasse Tyson in Manhattan, New York. And there's a panel, it's a panel discussion of the Big Bang and Wheeler is sitting at the far left and Alan Guth is there and you know, the string theory guy uh, and, and Smolin is sitting there and one other person, you know, major players. They're all in the faculty of Columbia University, uh, the physics department. And I turned to my friend as, as they're having this panel discussion and said, is anybody up there in line for the Nobel? And my friend uh, says, yeah, see that guy sitting in the middle, Lee Smolin? He's actually used Darwinian evolution to explain black holes and stellar evolution. Uh, you know, people think he's brilliant. And I just, you know, thought to myself, shit. I mean, you know, us biologists haven't figured out evolution and this guy's copying it, you know, for his purposes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, yeah. But, but my point being that, that I think people aren't thinking, they're only thinking in a very superficial way about this, yeah. not, you know, process. I'll throw in something else. So it's Audible Credit Day today. And uh, I, um, much as I found Margaret Atwood's The Testaments, an interesting audio book, I decided what shall I have this month? And um, I thought I'd go for Harari's Sapiens. And as I went out for a run this morning in uh, Norfolk Park in Sheffield, I uh, thought, yeah, I could do with uh, Peter and John to rewrite this, really. Yes. It's a bit wrong. Yeah. <laughs> I think the Harari thing is definitely you know, there, there, was, there, was, there was a big bang, and then there was life, and then yeah, there was genetics, right. and then here we are, you know, yeah. and uh, a very neat story. And I thought, yeah. Yeah, I'll go on. There's some interesting, an interesting kind of historical moments or archaeological or anthropological moments in it. But I thought you could do something really interesting with that account on that scale. Yeah. But uh, I will persevere with it. <laughs> Steve, um, one of the, um, the people that, uh, one of the mates of um, Lee Smolin is Carlo Rivelli and Rupert. Wegerith is a big fan of Ravelli, and he's mentioned him a few times to me, and um, and and I kind of this this helps to explain why I I find yeah this this, this stuff doesn't go anywhere. No, um, no, it doesn't. I mean, if we were to look at it culturally and philosophically, it doesn't it doesn't it doesn't grapple with the postmodernity of it because. You know, for you know anyone in kind of many people in you know kind of humanities and social sciences, you know, post modernity is just relativistic kind of gobbledygook. But when you start to um, think about it in the way that I've heard on these encounters and I've read about in the last kind of eighteen months ago, you know, you do get something quite important there that is beyond just relativistic. You know, it's not just a matter of anything goes. There are um, forms and structures that are emergent and patterns and aesthetics as uh, Andrew was pointing out with his account of music but um, so there's a great reliance on a modern account of a postmodern condition if I was to borrow those words yeah. um, and, I, and I think that's still that's uh, culturally very reassuring for people that there is a there is a, a kind of script, uh, uh, you know, uh, there is a clockwork universe and, a, and, a, and some kind of clockwork uh, dimensions that then go into uh, evolution and uh, biology as well. But, you know, what we're finding here is something that's not. Yeah. I'm just, um, uh, so Rupert Wegerith, I've just mentioned, is um, Professor of Education at Cambridge and um, He's very interested in all of this stuff, and I've tried to get him into this group, 
and and I think he's kind of distracted by all sorts of things at the moment. But um, I think he'd find these discussions very interesting. Well, he can uh, he can you can send him some. I'll of the send him the videos. And... Yeah. So there have been a couple of major uh, television productions talking about our esteemed president and his belief in conspiracy theories. And which has made me think hard, long and hard about why is it that the American public is so enamored of these? And, and there are there are deliverables for that. But the, but the bottom line is that, to your point, Steve, everyone loves a narrative. But the problem, as I see it, is that the narrative that we believe with regard to our own evolution is backwards. I've said that before, and we know that that's illogical. It's reasoning after the fact. It's it's tantamount that we understand from the beginnings. And again, I'm not saying I'm right, but there has to be a way to understand our ontology and epistemology in a forward, in a prograde direction in order to realize what the progression has been. If we continue to believe this, that's so story, which are women's story, which yeah. is no experimental evidence. Okay. Uh, we just, and as I've said before, I mean, I, I think that there is a human signature in physics that makes us believe these things in a way which is makes us feel comfortable with it, but they, they but it obfuscates the the, the tr it undermines the truth, even of you know the purest of sciences, in my opinion. Hmm. So I don't know if that's what you were saying about the postmodern. Yeah, I, I I think so. It's just you know yeah there is a you know the, there's a, you know. It, it's 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 simple causalities really this happened then this happened you know the big bang happened well i suppose as i was listening more i've listened to peter and the more i've thought about this stuff I so i suppose the big bang's happening all the time you know really isn't it you know is it is it a past event or you know when you're talking about nil potency that isn't that isn't that a kind of you know a grand event in the past of of, of, of formation that but we that it must be going on in the present too creation is now okay okay so i have support for my uh <laughs> creation is now and yeah I, I i've got to say i think the big bang theory is um is the archaeology and not physics I think I, I, well that's what suddenly clicked for me this morning and i've I suppose I've been thinking that way, but thinking about some of the things that you've been talking about and what I've been listening to, he's, he, you know, and then, and then, you know, what then sort of, well, we, we start off with this big bang and then we kind of have this, and then all this, this stuff that about epigenetics that I've been kind of listening yeah. to John about, I thought, well, you know, there's kind of a big hole, hole in this story that, uh, you know, there was Neanderthals and then there's sapiens, you know, it's just... So what, yeah. what what needs to happen then is um, if if the Big Bang is archaeology and not physics, that doesn't do away with history. We clearly have history, and history clearly matters. Absolutely yeah. matters. <laughs> but yeah. what what I was going to say is that the Big Bang is used to to prevent people investigating physics. Because, for example, if you want to work out a grand unified theory. All the talk is of uh, these various interactions coming off at different points in the historical sequence, mm. instead of being in a physics relationship with each other, they're in a historical relationship with each other, and that's okay. And that and that actually dampens down discussion of real the real physics. Peter, that's really that's interesting what you just said. Mm. <laughs> Is, uh, is this last few minutes an argument in favor of uh, Fred Hoyle's continuous... No, I don't uh, like that either, because I don't think that's true either. Because Fred Hoyle's continuous creation theory is, is um, still an expansionist universe. I don't believe in an expansionist universe, personally. But, but I don't wish to nail my colors to any particular cosmological mast. But I don't... No, no, it's expansionist in that uh, local geometry shifts, but it's um, it's uniform behavior over all time and space. So is that violating the concept of new potency because there's no initial origin? Peter, you're off. Peter, you're off. We can't hear you. 
Where, where are you? Uh, oh, sorry, I've just <laughs> tapped it. <laughs> okay, start over. Couldn't, couldn't hear it. Doing. I don't think we're doing the right interpretation somehow. Um, you know, I think the, 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 these things may have a different origin to, to the way we think. I, I, I have this inertia theory, which um, doesn't require an expansion of the universe mm. to get redshift and uh, dark energy. In fact, I've given a talk about it to, the, to that other group, which is available if people want to look at it. Can um, you send the link, actually, Peter? Can you, can you send, send the link? Yeah. Yeah. Send you the link. But it's, it's in Quisical. If you look up Quisical, you can find it on there. Um, just, just since we're mentioning... Want... Sorry? Just since we're mentioning Fred Hoyle, and um, I didn't know that um, Hoyle had this theory about evolution from space, and Andrew, uh, I was talking to Andrew about it. Um, John, John, where do you sit on, on Hoyle's stuff? You know, it's been years since I... I thought Hoyle was... That's the card... He is the... He wrote the rules of card games, didn't he? No, or no, no. This is Edmund the, Hoyle. Oh. Edmund Hoyle. <laughs> that's the the uh, cosmic uh, origin. The astrophysicist. Uh huh. No, I, I'm sorry. I haven't read that stuff in years. I don't. I. I. I'll, I won't comment on that. Okay. I, I read it probably in junior high. It really made sense to me at that point. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a lot of things did. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a ten-year-old for ten to twelve-year-old for the British guys. <laughs> Okay. Um, it, it was in the it was uh, it was doing the rounds a couple of days ago because uh, his co-author because uh, they they also argued that viruses came from space, for example, and um, his co-author made a prediction about the current pandemic um, last year. So this which, is panspermia. Is that yes, that's the right. idea? That's right. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, I, I started my when I tried to exhaust my pursuit of lipid biology. I mean, it went back to pulsars because they do produce polycyclic hydrocarbons. So in that sense, I guess I'm talking poly polyspermia, but it's not exactly that. Mm. I mean, that's a little bit too phantasmagoric for my, my tastes. Mm. I mean, all I had to do is mix oil and water and I'm, you know, and I'm, I'm on, on my way. So, but yeah, yeah. So I, I'm, I am familiar with that idea. Mm. Or panpsychism, for that matter, which I think again is like this simplistic syllogistic way of thinking. It's not really thinking about the networking idea as the the thing that holds everything together and provides that uh, stepwise kind of understanding that allows for the testing of hypotheses. It's mm. just poof, you know, poof. You have panpsychism. <laughs> poof. You have. Yeah, uh, that's too magical. It's too too much like magic. To, for my taste as a scientist yeah yeah but, but history is really fundamental in the in all of these discussions history is um it seems imprinted in the way that peter thinks about the nil pose and, and it's imprinted in the way that you conceive of evolutionary biology um I, whether you need a big bang to have history i don't you, I, we clearly have history whether there was a big bang or not so um but um, I'm just I'm actually just a, a random thought for any Marxists here. What does what does historical materialism look like if we we look at it from this perspective? Well, I, I think I mean I, I'll, I'll kind of sort of an odd kind of Marxist, I suppose. But I think also seeing but that dialectic, you know, that ongoing dialectic, I think is also can be and and I think Hegel himself. And I'm kind of speculating here, really, but I think this is also a kind of expression of nilpotency. You know, it's you've got emergence from this dialectic, but one way of looking at this is through the uh, uh, through a diachronic historical perspective. I mean, that you know, you have got the situation where I would say that history just doesn't exist. You know, you have got that simultaneously. It's a it's a thing that gives us. Uh, a personal reference points culturally, uh, sociologically and psychologically and anthropologically, but we also must accept that it doesn't really exist too, you know, it's, um, and so we must be both synchronic and diachronic at the same time. But, so, you know, but I was also, you know, that relates to the thing I was just going to flag up in relation to that was Harari talks about the cognitive revolution, you know, 
70,000 to 30,000 BC, you know, and this, this, you know, we, we, we grew a bigger, we grew a bigger brain and then we had tools. Well, I always wonder about the, you know, even if you kind of look at that historically, you always think about, worry about the causality in that, you know, and, and, you know, it's entirely reciprocal, that process in which tools and cognition is born because, you know, they, they are an expression of that cognition and the, you know, the, either way, you know, uh, so yeah, that's just adding on to your random thought. Well, I, I would add language into that, Steve. Yeah. Uh, I, I very very much, that. very much, yes, yeah, and I would say more generally, you know, yeah, yeah. And, and you know, language similarly goes all the way back to the origins. So when I talk about cellular communication, that's the origin of language, in my opinion. And the, and the structural homologue of that is both tool making and language are, are uh, housed within the area of Broca. And only primates have an area of Broca. It's exclusive to humans and other large primates. And I think that the reason that we are different from other primates is because we're bipedal. That bipedalism created huge selection pressure for this. And that's why we've gone several steps further than other large primates have. You know, the idea that we need, because we, in tool making, your hands are, are preoccupied, but you have to communicate how you're making this tool, right? That's what the selection pressure was. Oh, and I guess if I finish that thought, then written language was the next iteration and written language is the basis of civilization. Without that capacity to communicate across generations, you don't have civilization. Hmm. It's just a bunch of people living in caves. And we may go back to that. Yeah, well, um, and, uh, you know, machi machines are also a text as well. You know, that's another way of looking at it, you know, so they see this kind of... A, uh, I think I think I was talking to somebody uh, about um, social social media, and uh, we were talking. Was it you, Mark? It was you, Mark. It probably. Was it? We, were we were talking about you know seeing the whole of uh, the whole of you know the whole of social media, including the technology that drives, including the hardware and everything, as a text. Yeah. You know, not just. The utterances you get in people's in Donald Trump's tweets. Yeah, you know, it's it's the entire thing is the text. You know. Yeah. Um, so, Friedrich Kittler. Bipedalism um, uh, metaphor. Yeah, social media has cut us off at the knees. <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> Perhaps we'll find a new use for our feet then. John, could I, could I ask you about endosymbiosis? Is that something that applies only to cells or can it be applied to higher organisms or to institutions? In the way I'm thinking, what, what it reminds me of, that, and, and anthropologically, we marry our enemies. Yeah, well, uh, I've made the argument, so I've mentioned in the past on these Zooms that there's this whole burgeoning idea of niche construction, which was fostered by Lalande and, uh, and his associates um, in England, actually, um, they didn't. They didn't invent the idea. They just. It actually was D uh, Darwin who observed that uh, earthworms uh, retain their uh, waterborne kidneys because they were able to fashion the soil around them to accommodate uh, these uh, nephridia. But that was the first observation of how organisms mon uh, modify their environment. But beyond that, the endosymbiosis. As, so my idea was, well, maybe the, the unicell was the first niche construction. So the endogenization of factors in the environment makes for one of a piece. The organism and its ecology are one and the same. Um, and there's ample evidence that that's true. Um, and so I, in my mind's eye, you have go from all the way from the unicell to Gaia and, ev and everything in between through that endogenization process. Yeah. So a university <laughs> is kind of, can you describe it in endosymbiotic terms, that it is gathered in its, in, in its environment yeah. as a living thing? Yeah. Yeah, if you have a chance to see um, this uh, Sean Carroll book, um, uh, in, it's, a, it's a film, uh, Serengeti Rules. 
it's all about contemporary ecology. I was I was totally unaware of how far it is. Um, and so, I mean, the first observation was somebody studying tide pools and decides to take the starfish out of the tide pool and the tide pool organisms, they all collapse. You put the starfish back in, everybody's happy again. So that's an, an example. That's a, a, a tangible example. And, that, you know, the re restoration of Yellowstone Park in this country yeah. by wolves, you know, re-inhabiting Yellowstone or uh, in, on the Serendip uh, Serengeti Plain. Um, I think that, I don't know what the lions run, whatever. Yeah, I mean, everything is, is inter interconnected. And the, and the animal life is connected with the fauna as well. Okay, well, all we'll take that a... to description of an organization, a company. Yeah. What would that tell you that someone running a company ought to do? I think that's Gladwell. You know, he's, he talks about that in Blink, that you, you have to stick to your vision and mission statement, that, that there, are, there are first principles of the organization that have to be adhered to. And when you deviate from that... Well, hang on, animals don't have a mission statement. I would go for that. Stafford Beer on, on, on organizations, actually. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's the Aristotelian telos, isn't it? I thought it was entelechy, but I don't know. I'm not a good on Greek. I thought, I thought entelechy was what that was. A, this is about. Maybe it's Tilios. Okay. okay. Um, I mean, universities are very interesting from this perspective, though, aren't they? Because um, you've got professors of jazz. I always find the professors of jazz the most interesting. So where did that come from? Because you have this weird activity that takes place in sort of smoky bars in, um, in you know, Southern America. And gradually, um, this university thing gradually reaches its tentacles and sucks in sucks in jazz into the academy and you have professors of jazz and they suck up the local art college and they suck up all sorts of other things and they create business schools which um will do all sorts of other crazy stuff i mean they are um they're, they're, they're yeah it's, it's like the borg um but but what's also interesting is technology technology corporations seem to be behaving in the same way yes and it's they're almost as if they're both they're after the same territory. They protoplasmically engulf and absorb. Yeah. So look at what look at Microsoft's behavior with institutions right now, because that Microsoft is such an interesting thing. Uh, we're all on Teams. I mean, I know we're using Zoom, but um, uh, Elizabeth and I have been saying probably Zoom isn't going to be much longer for this world, but we're all on Teams. No. Nah. I'll, I'll let her sit, talk about that, but... Um, uh, is that true? <laughs> I thought it was worth £7 billion from nothing. <laughs> because it's fully replicable. So every time Zoom comes up with something, Teams just takes it. And Teams is owned by Microsoft. It's integrated into the full Microsoft suite. Zoom is just sitting off there to the side. They'll, if, if you look at what um, Instagram today just released a challenger to TikTok, and the Americans are effectively flagging that they're going to ban TikTok. Mm. It's the problem with all of those apps is they're, they're one trick ponies. And what Microsoft and Apple and all the others have around them is an, ecology. an ecosystem that locks you in to their particular thing. So Microsoft is quite clever. It's just letting Zoom work out what people want. Mm. And then it goes, OK, that's not hard yeah. to do. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. How interesting. So it really is a gigantic protoplasmic being. Well, I mean, you've got you. So is the university. So you can't write universities. Right, we went for protoplasmic yeah. being. Yeah, but you can't write universities off. But when you put two of these things together, now what's what's the biological equivalent of that? When when you see it's it's almost this tension between cooperation and competition. Well, there is a driving principle of bigger is better in biology because you can't get it. <laughs> basically but i was just thinking i mean but you have to distinguish between normal biology and cancer biology because if it becomes this cancerous growth then that's pathologic yeah right? yes that's right so I, was gonna ask, I mean but i assume i assume that the vi the vitality the viability of any given organization university microsoft the closer it 
remains faithful to human physiology, the more likely it is to survive. Yeah. When it deviates, when it's top down or bottom up, as opposed to what I talk about, which is middle out, yeah. then it, it- That's it, good. That's, that's artificial and, and, and it, it kills the organization. I so think. we build the Leviathan. The Leviathan is a, a model human being and therefore viable because it looks like a human being. Is that right? Have I got that? So we don't want to build protoplasmic things. We want to build an artificial person. Yeah, but I think the golem is this, you know, character in, you know, in, in uh, Judaism. Sure, and the golem comes to a very bad end, you know, and as, you know, if, if, if I'm going to be a good Jew, I'm not going to build one of those, you know. <laughs> I thought they just, the rabbi just kept the golem in the attic. Uh, under sure, but it's, I oh, it's locked up, you know that. Oh, yeah, right. <laughs> But uh, again, I, I would I would submit that I mean I wrote a paper. So so basically, um, up until now, uh, we have used human form, bilateral symmetry, Vitruvian man, whatever you want to refer to it as, as the as the foundation for organizations. But that's artificial. We know that there's this hugely important co cooperativity that goes all the way from the smallest unit, from the cell all the way to the neurons in our brains and everything in between that has to be serviced in a way which is consistent with the homeostatic sure. principle. Right? But at the top end of that pyramid, at Liverpool University, um, things are a bit can funny. Can you hear me? Yes. But that's what we were talking about in the last Zoom is that when you have people on the board, and Rich was talking about people, you know, the boards of directors that are dissociated from, you know, it's the mind body thing. You know, Descartes was, was wrong. It's not mind body. It's one other piece. It's a holistic organ, organism that works based upon the same principles all the way down and all the way up. It's, it's cells all the way down. It's first principles that are faithful to those, to those principles. It, it, you have to remain fa faithful, faithful to those first principles and to so quantum mechanics. Cellular, you keep the body. faith. You're describing the Communist Party. Ooh. <laughs> are you not? I think it's a lot like Marxism, if that's what you mean, yeah. Mm. Right? Yeah. Mm. So why didn't that work? Because well, people we never had it. it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, there are, there are headwinds. I mean, you know, people are corrupt, uh, corrupted by greed and um, power, and that, that puts you in the modality of the cancer mo you know, mm. model Indeed. instead of the you know, homeostatic model, mm. right? What you just said, John, actually, was said by um, Ivan Illich in the 1970s, um, there are, um, who, who wrote about schools, and there's a wonderful book called De-Schooling Society, and there's another book called uh, Tools for Conviviality, and this is all about um, technology at a human scale, institutions at a human scale, um, and what happens when you, when you go beyond that. Yeah, somebody was, uh, I think it was Steve was saying that animals, that, do animals comply with the same rule? Yes, animals do. In fact, animals are constrained by their environments and they, they know in, innately what they should and shouldn't do. But humans have trans, transgressed their constraints. You know, birds fly and people fly, but you know, airplanes ruin the atmosphere and they carry viruses and they, you know, they do all sorts of things that, that are not constrained. And that's the problem we have. I. I firmly believe that we need to uh, we need to do what happened with the heliocentrism back in the 18th century. We have to remove ourselves from the center of the biosphere. We have to get over ourselves. We have to appreciate what we have, but not as the way to beat every other organism on the planet over the head with it. You know, this is this is the great tragedy. I think that we we overarch our mission, um, and in so doing, we do all kinds of harm. I mean, do, we do good as well, but on balance, we're not doing so well. So if that's, I want to bring it back to education then, because education is the mechanism whereby you create the conditions where you have a fighting chance of being able to do that with the next generation. Yes, I agree. Absolutely. Right. And then, you know, that comes back to, is it inculcation or is it, are you teaching someone to think yeah. or only to comply? Right. And and to whose and for whose convenience is it to you know, even the, even putting students in you know rows and in seats and having that constraint sends a message that 
you know, you're in a box. Right. You're in a, you're, you're constrained and you must be able to comply or you won't get out of this place. At least you won't without a degree. And you will without, but you won't have a degree, right? So it's all the rubber stamping of human beings. Whereas I think, I think that education is teaching people that it's not just fight or flight, that problem solving is doable by every one of us. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Okay. All right. I'm, I'm, I'm going to run out of battery. You're going to run out of battery. Um, we've been going, we, we should stop in a minute. I just wonder if I could um, intrigue anybody by some stuff I've been messing around, but you know, I've got this, one of these Fitbit things. Um, and, um, I've been talking to, I was talking to John about, you know, simple ways that we can take sort of do physiological measurements as at the same time as we look at communication or other, other kinds of activities. And um, it's going to be a bit techy, but um, I'm going to share my screen. So I've been, oh, sorry, those are pieces of equations. Hang on. I've been, um, uh, what you can do with the Fitbit is you the, all the data is um, available so you can actually ask Fitbit to give me my heart rate for I'm going to ask it to give me my heart rate for this session and so I could actually um, sorry I'll just move down here so this this is um, this is not for this session this was earlier today when I went out for a walk and what I basically uh, have plotted here is I've got access to the details of what my heart rate was every 10 seconds or so and you can do calculations on that so you you can just plot it as a number but you can also plot it as entropy so you can see okay how much did it vary um how, how surprising are the changes in it as, as time passes and you can do that in a number of ways so you can look at its movements up and down you can um uh you look at it look at it in different chunks it's almost like looking at a heartbeat as a piece of music and as, as I've been sort of doing that, I was thinking, OK, so what if what if what if actually I've got a drummer in my chest? And I was always told by musicians that drummers always play melodically. They don't they don't just hit the thing. They they play in a they it has a feel that has a a, a, a a feeling to it. And, um, and maybe maybe the heart's doing that. So my having having sort of pulled back this kind of data, my next step is to try and think, OK, so if I know my heart was doing that kind of thing at this particular time period, what was I saying? What was I doing? So I could look at particularly the time I spent in this session, which I've now got on video. And I know the words that I was speaking and I know the, the, the other things that were going on in the video. Can I analyze that and overlay that on top of this? Um, what if I was playing the piano? What if I was you know, doing, doing something else? Can I then look at that data? So I, I, I'm finding this very intriguing and interesting. I don't know um, if this is worth pursuing, but my guess is that the heart rate has some relation to the kind of epigenetic marks that John, you're talking about. And maybe this is a way in which we can overlay some of this stuff and, and get a deeper, a deeper sort of um, empirical uh, grasp on this stuff. So do you have any sense of the, well, there must be some delay between the event you're observing and your reaction to it. Yeah, I, I've only just started doing it and I'm, I'm almost certain that there is, yes. So um, I've, I've said, you know, you need some stress in order to learn. Too much stress and you, yeah. you'll black out, literally. <laughs> yes. So, um, I find this interesting in the context of, you know, what, what, it, what events were occurring when you had these peaks and valleys, yes. and is there something to be said about that? I mean, my, in a glib sense, um, what you're doing, so in, in biology, we, we talk about experiments that are done in silico. It, mm -hmm. it has nothing to do with biology. It's all done on a computer. So if, you're, if I think about um, distance learning as in silico, that's really the worst possible case in a classroom of a teacher that really is totally clueless as to what's happening to their students, mm -hmm. as opposed to this, where you're actually getting biofeedback yeah. in order to maximize the learning experience yeah. and minimize the, the fear factor. 
right? Because you have to minimize fear, otherwise they won't, people, students will not learn. Yeah. So, well, I, I, think, I think there is something very, uh, uh, yeah, I, well, I agree. And I think I'd like to pursue this. I think if anybody's interested in doing the same stuff, buy a Fitbit and, and maybe a few of us could do this and, and compare notes and just see what our, our collective experience is. Um, they're only a hundred quid and they're amazing things. Mark Sydney wants to know what code you're using. Oh, it's Python. Python. Okay. Yeah. How do you interface that with How do you interface it with this? Uh, there's a, um, an application programming interface for the Fitbit and it's, it took me a day to work out how to get into it, but once you're in, it's easy. Okay. I, can, I can show you how to do it, um, Sydney, if you, if you want to do it. You'd be interested. Um, so that reminds me, it was, there, are, there are at least a couple of um, programs, one at, I think, uh, Sussex University, another one at Oxford in the philosophy department that are, these, these are groups that are talking very much like what we're talking about in the Zoom, and they're funded by the Templeton Foundation. Oh, really? I've tried to get money out of the Templeton Foundation for years. Um, but I think that this might, I mean, is that something we might, you know, in the context of this Fitbit uh, hypothesis, you know? Yeah. Um, well, I, I'm, we're having... Running at a distance. I've been having discussions with Elizabeth about um, ways in which we can make Liverpool a hospitable niche for ourselves <laughs> rather than the um, rather than what, what it seems to be most of the time. Um, and, and again, I think, I think, yeah, the, but there's, there seems to be something that's coming out of this group, which first of all is very interesting and important, but may be practical and useful. Um. I might add that not, neither one of the programs I looked at is, is talking diachronically. No, no they're, they're just not thinking. No, and that, that, is, that is the key move. That is the key move. I mean, I've always been nervous about the Templeton Foundation because I think they're looking for God, they're not looking for <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. But that aside, I mean, I'm not sure. You know, I don't know what their motivation is, although John Templeton was a true believer. And, you know, so, yeah, so there may be a hidden agenda there. but. But in, in fact, I mean, if that's what they're looking for, I mean, if, and you're taking a diachronic approach, well, you're going after the prime mover. So why not? You know, why not think in those terms? Sort of. Wow. That's yeah. a great sentence. Take the diachronic approach and look for the prime, the prime mover. mover. <laughs> <laughs> like lead into a TV show. John, I'm going to steal that. Yeah. I want you to know. It's mine now. So, so if we if we don't get any money, I can become some sort of televangelist, and um, <laughs> um, <laughs> where, where everyone's wired into their Fitbits. Um, but seriously, this technology is going in this direction. The Chinese are already. I mean, they're doing horrible things. They're wiring. The, the danger of not taking a diachronic approach is very serious, actually, because what the Chinese are doing is they're putting brain scanning devices on kids' heads and uh, devices to look at the gaze of kids and, and, and basically berating them when they're not staring at the screen all the time or they fall asleep. Um, so we need something much richer and um, more powerful in terms of its explanatory power um, to actually take some of this stuff on. I don't know if you saw that Elon Musk is um, launching a music, what he calls is a music player. And it's a device that fits behind the ear and it was mar it's marketed as this device will send music directly into your brain. <laughs> now that's, that's marketing speak. He's not interested in sending music into your brain. He's interested in getting the data that he's going to get out from the brain into his device. That's what he's after. So that's the, that's the next that's physiological. His, that's his Wetmore project. Yeah. Important cause of wet wear. Yeah. Yeah. That. Yeah. 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 So, so we're going to see lots more of this. This, this, I, I kind of think. I mean, I know we've just written this paper um, about education, and um, and really, the message from that paper is: stop talking about technology. It, the biology is the thing that we really need to understand. It's the thing that that that's where the discussion is going to be.
Well, and I think the concern, my concern about the Chinese is that they're going to try and they're going to do what you're, you're describing, and then they're going to go and, and find the gene that determines whether you pay attention yeah. like Yeah. And then they're going to clone people yeah. so that they have that long attention span, but they're going to be, they're going to be uh, zombies. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I mean, they 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 will just it will be very destructive for them. So hopefully, um, a, a bit like the Americans, you know, you go down the, that terrible road and then you stop, <laughs> you stop just before it gets completely catastrophic. Let's hope that they do um, stop and think, but you just don't know. Gross. You broke up a lot. Mark. Oh, sorry. Yeah, it's okay. It's it's my Fitbit. It was phantasmagorical. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Is so, there some way, is there some way to to get biofeedback from the, that Fitbit? In terms of well, all it, all it, go on. In terms of what? Well, those peaks and valleys. I mean, you want to you want to maximize the peaks and minimize the valleys. So, if you had, I guess you'd have a visual feedback that you could observe. But if it were non-cognitive, a way to you know maximize that the experience, if you will. You know, you have you're going to have Maslow's peak experience as a result of that you and that Fitbit. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, um, you could. Yes. Um, that would be very interesting. That would be very, very interesting. Gordon Pask did something like this in the 1960s. Um, he had a he he had a thing called Music Color, and it was a it was basically a light show that responded to music uh, performance. It's recently been recreated, hasn't it? Yeah, um, uh, um, not sure. It was rebuilt this year. For a no, that's, show. that was that was the Colloquy of Mobiles, which I went to see in yeah. Paris. Um, the, the music color, I, it might have been recreated at some point, but basically the idea was that musicians would play, this thing would listen, uh, it's amazing technology, and it would um, produce a light show in response to the music, which if the music got boring, it would try to stimulate the performers to do something more interesting. Yeah, something like that. Yeah, well, yeah. you know, feedback. Yeah. Would be a way. Would it be a heuristic, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Of Anticipatory up. system, Sydney. So. It, it, yeah, yeah. No, it, it probably, it probably, yes, it probably is an anticipate. I mean, Pask was very smart. I mean, educators are now cognizant of the fact Mark? that we each learn in different ways. So this would be a way to personalize the educational experience. Mm. Mark? Yeah. Yeah, Sydney wanted to know if you can use another language other than Python. Yes, that. you can. Okay. Okay. All right. Well, um, we haven't I, heard the ice cream man. Sorry. No ice cream man. Well, actually, he came and I muted myself because uh -huh. I didn't want to be Steve uh -huh. and I didn't want to be. I didn't want us to be interrupted. Right. But yes. Um, yeah, he's done his. He's done his rounds now. Wallace Stevens wrote a poem, The Emperor of, uh, of Ice Cream. I, I really was, I was into the ice cream man. It somehow was something coming from the cosmos telling us that we're on the right track. <laughs> <laughs> For a Cornetto, perhaps. I don't know about that. <laughs> All right, well. Um, Mark? Yes. I, I'm sorry to interrupt again. I just want to ask a quick question. Um, so are you saying that with those, um, with all this big data and um, kind of with uh, Microsoft and these um, computing, and computing companies, that people, that scientists and, and the general population have signed away their intellectual rights because of, by agreeing to these contracts of working with teams and stuff? So they're sucking our ideas out and then using them and not saying, holding us legally bound? Oh, I don't know. Is that what um, you were saying? I'm, I'm, I'm less, I, I'm less paranoid than that. Uh, that there is a lot of stuff on and the, the whole discourse around technology and education at the moment is absolutely paranoid about the big tech companies, and and I kind of look at these 
places and I think well this is how you get this stuff off the ground this is how you get really actually the stuff we can do with technology is amazing um, um, but what about ownership and stuff well ownership is a question anyway isn't it I mean ownership is is you know what is ownership that, that's a re that's a very good question and people have been asking that for a long time yeah. <laughs> Seb, I don't know if you've got any thoughts about this. On ownership in general? No, but I mean, the, are, are we basically dealing with, um, uh, you know, nasty big corporations that are going to sell our souls and or we sell our souls to them and all the rest of it? No, I mean, uh, what's going on, particularly now in the pandemic condition, is definitely something to watch. I mean, this 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 massive rollout of Mm -hmm. of Microsoft uh, uh, suit and, uh, and, uh, and and teams. I mean, uh, I think George Siemens just commented on it uh, the other day. It's just, it's just, it's just, there's a monopoly in the making. I mean, uh, or, or we, we've had it already uh, in the making for a while, but now this, this rollout in, of teams in, in schools is, is, is basically um, creating a de facto um, standard and, and that that will that will configure that space for for years probably to come mm -hmm. because the thing that the rolling this back is going to be incredibly hard in, in in many places and i and i see this this push for convergence um all over the place right now yeah, yeah. so so there's so it's actually in, in, in the german discourse it's often it's actually a completely schizophrenic kind of state because they're 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 so um, paranoid with uh, with um, you know privacy issues, data security issues, you know the whole the whole um, European kind of legal framework for that. But then they're kind of betting on the large corporations to, to play fair in this regard, you know, which is you basically don't know where the, where the servers are. You, know, you just have to believe the word of, of Microsoft, and uh, and it's kind of sold as as the gold standard now at this time. And, and I think this is completely bonkers you know, from my really? perspective. Zoom is trying to claim that because the servers are in Singapore that you are protected. So Zoom is a, is a Chinese product. Mm. And they do know that those servers are sending all the data back to China. So while it's stored in Singapore, there's absolutely nothing preventing the Chinese company accessing the data and extracting it. Right, and and Microsoft has has, has signed. I mean, they, though they are you know giving some signs that they you know setting up European based servers and so on. At the end of the day, they have signed all the contracts with the U.S. Uh, government uh, to comply um, if there's any sort of uh, um, you know governmental agency that needs to look into stuff. So <laughs> that's basically there the whole logic ends that, that this would be a particular safe kind of haven, you know, to work with in education. It just doesn't, it doesn't add up to me. But it's, I mean, to some extent, all the data you send out there is already hoovered up. I mean, in Australia, there's something called Pine Gap. And that is, that is a US military facility run in Australia that hoovers up. Sure. And it's, it's search word. And, you know, that, that's the reality. Anything that goes out there across the digital line is potentially being analysed. The, the other side of the coin is there's so much data out there that even quantum computers can't possibly handle. So, yeah. you know... Yeah, absolutely. But, but the interesting... we, can be, we can be paranoid. At another level, we also can be fairly reliant on the inability of humans to make patterns out of things. <laughs> <It's not laughs> right. But yeah, I mean, no one's asking the questions. We've all rushed online and we've all rushed to do things online, but lying behind that are big, big gaps in the security of that data. Maybe we should follow this up next week. <laughs> no, <laughs> we'll all have disappeared. Has anyone ever tried to read the fine print of what they're signing with these data? <laughs> it's like a book. That's a very good question, uh, Sydney. Yeah, I think for next week, we should all read the fine print of um, <laughs> what we've signed up to with Zoom. And, and can you understand it? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, maybe we should call it a day and um, 
let's meet again next week. Okay. But thank you very much. It's it's been as usual, um, very wide ranging. I think there's some stuff that we discussed in the beginning around the physics, which was uh, very important, and um, and and the stuff around history. I think too is uh, a, a key thing. So thank you very much. Okay. You. See you next week, folks. Yep. Bye bye. Okay. Bye bye. Thanks, guys. Bye bye. Ciao.